We are uh, continuing in our series on uh, James, and uh, today, as we, we, we continue, it's on the topic, uh, you need a, a faith that works when you suffer, uh, when you suffer. And uh, suffering is coming, I, I, there's no getting away, away from it. Um, all that live godly in Christ Jesus, it says, will suffer tribulation. So you're going to have troubles, you're going to have trials. Um, it also says, uh, you know, most people think when they get married, that's going to solve all their problems. <laughs> you just double them. Uh, it says in 1 Corinthians that, uh, hey, if you're, you're married, you will have trouble. <laughs> Duh. You're just going to have it. There's going to be, there's going to be troubles. There's going to be tribulation. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be losses. There's going to be grief. There's going to be disappointments. Uh, there's going to be persecution. All that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer tribulation. You're going to be persecuted uh, for your faith. So it's not a matter if it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when it's going to happen. You're going to suffer. I'm going to suffer. In fact, the text right in the middle of our text today says, in the face of suffering, and this whole book has been about a faith that works. You know, show me your, your faith by what you say, and I'll show you my faith by what I do. So I'm going to have a faith that works even when things aren't going to my way and when I suffer, when I suffer. He says, in this book, I think in this, this passage we're in right now, he's going to say that there are seven ways to show your faith when you are suffering. And the first one is pretty simple, just be patient. Be patient when you're suffering. <laughs> Most of us, hurry up, get this over with, Lord. I can't take this any longer. And we're so wimpy when it comes to suffering, aren't we? That's because we don't, we don't like pain at any cost. Uh, I mean, uh, one of the things that the doctors always say is, we'll try to keep you out of your pain. And they'll, and they'll medicate you so you don't have pain. And so, uh, but we just don't want that. Let me get, get through this as fast as I can. We're not patient. We're very impatient people. He says, be patient then, brothers. He says, to the second coming of our Lord. He says, actually, to the coming of our Lord. I say second coming because I already know that he's come the first time, right? For James, he's already said he's come the first time. In fact, uh, this week I looked up, there's like over 30 prophecies of Jesus' co first coming. 30 of them. I mean, we know that the one in Micah, that Bethlehem and Judah would have the place where he would be born. And we'll see that as we go through Advent season here. And we know from Daniel 9, if you're a real deep student of the word and are really willing to wrestle with the Bible and dig deep, you'll find that it predicted right down to the week that Jesus would die. Isaiah 53, it's like, Jesus, like, like Isaiah is standing there. It's like he's standing there. And, and Jesus is on the cross suffering. And, and it's like he's writing like, but he's 700 years before Christ. There's all these prophecies of his first coming. His first coming. And it tells us in Isaiah 53 that he would die. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. That, that this suffering servant, Jesus, would actually bear our sin on the cross. We're told in verse 10 of that passage, the father would be pleased to bruise his son. That just strikes me really odd. How many of you really enjoyed spanking your children? Oh, you can't spank them anymore. Okay, let me think of something else. <laughs> But those of you who did, you don't enjoy that. That's parental responsibility. Why does it say he was pleased to bruise his son? That's because he was the sin bearer. He knew at that moment that he was placing the judgment due to our sin upon Jesus and that he was going to suffer and die for our sins. He loved you and me so much he was willing to bruise his own son. It goes on in that same passage saying that he was going to raise him up from the dead, yet he would see his seed, spiritual seed. He would be resurrected from the dead. The, the, the Bible has these Old Testament prophecies about his first coming, that he would be raised from the dead. Now, Jesus, when he was here on earth, also began to make some predictions and some prophecies. He prophesied, and you hear this almost at every funeral, John chapter 14, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. 
He predicted while he was alive, I'm going to die and I'm going to be resurrected from the grave and I'm going to come back for you. And in between, I'll, I'll be preparing a place for you. I'll tell you what, it must be really special. It must be. The Trump Tower is nothing like heaven. You see, in heaven, all that gold Trump's got in that tower, that's the dirt you walk on out in the streets. You see, it, it, this is going to be a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous place. All right. Jesus said, I, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I am going to come back. Well, be, after Jesus, you know, had, had told, told him that, he did go to the cross and died and began the preparation for us to go there. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. If you've got sin, you can't get into heaven. So you have to have that. He, he's already begun that pre preparation process. He died, he was buried. And then he met on the Mount of Olives with his disciples. And all of a sudden, I think it was the Shekinah glory cloud that we talked about in the book of Exodus, that cloud that was over the temple, was over the tabernacle. It was a flame of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. I think that cloud came down. The Shekinah glory cloud. Text doesn't say that. I'm giving you my spin on this, okay? That cloud came down, and in the eyes of the disciples, Jesus left earth in the Shekinah glory cloud. He was gone. Two angels stood there saying, hey, why are you looking up into heaven? I know why I'd be looking up into heaven. Did you see that? Whoa. He said, why are you looking up into heaven? That same Jesus which was taken up into heaven is going to come, what? Again, just like you've seen him go. Jesus is coming back in the clouds, in the air, and he's coming back to the earth. That was the prediction of Jesus. Now the angels, after he's gone, something really unusual happened after the resurrection. There's 50 days to a feast in Israel called Pentecost. On the Pentecost following Jesus' resurrection, he sent the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit did a work where it baptized the believers in Jesus as Savior into the body of Christ. Now, this is not water baptism. This is spirit baptism. He took everyone who believed in Jesus and placed them in the body. Now, in Ephesians, it tells us Christ is the head of the church, and the church is his body. So Jesus is the head of this organism called a body of believers, Christians. It's the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2. Even Jesus had predicted this. And Matthew 16, he said, I will build my church. Future tense, it didn't exist at that time. You see, Jesus had to go into heaven, send the Holy Spirit, baptize us into the body of Christ. He took from the Jews and the Gentiles and brought them together into one new entity, the body of Christ, the church. From that original Pentecost Sunday following the, the resurrection and ascension of our Savior, that's when the church began, and the church is still here today. 2016 today, we, Bethany, are the church, the body of Christ. We meet in a local space and time. Everyone who's a genuine believer in Jesus has been baptized into that body as part of that. Jesus has promised that he was going to come back. We're still waiting for it. It could be today. Wouldn't that be something? All of our plans put on hold because we're not going to go where we're going. We're going to be with Jesus. The second coming of Christ, it says, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ, all those who are Christians that died from the day of Pentecost when the church began till now, the dead in Christ will rise first. The church is going. Then we which are alive and remain, it says, will be caught up together with the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's coming. First Thessalonians 4 says that. It says it's going to happen so instantaneously in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, it says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, that this mortal, that which it can die, will put on immort immortality. This corruptible, that's already dead and corrupted, will put on incorruption. And we're going to be out of here. We're going to have our bodies resurrected from, from the ground, from the ashes, from the sea. And we're going to go to be with Jesus. 
And while we're with Jesus, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 tells us that we're going to be appearing before the judgment seat of Christ. Not, not the great white throne judgment. This is a different judgment because at the judgment seat of Christ, you get a reward for what you've done in your life. We talked about that a little bit last time. You're going to get a reward for what you've done in your life. And it's going to be as tried by fire. The fire is going to be put to what you've done. And if it's been made of wood, hay, and stubble, perishable things, it'll be gone. But it's of silver, gold, and precious stones, okay? The fire won't damage it, and you're going to get great reward. It's talking about how have you invested your life for Christ. If you've been selfish with your life and lived for yourself, consumed, it's all gone. But the text goes on and says, but you'll be saved as though by fire. Our expression is by the skin of your teeth. You've gotten to heaven, but there's no reward. No reward. While we're being rewarded in heaven, the Bible tells us in Revelation 6 through 19 that there's going to be a terrible time on this earth. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, you have not, you Christians, you've not been appointed to wrath. But in Re Revelation 6 through 19, there's a time of wrath coming that such as never was nor ever shall be. Jesus in Matthew 24 called it the great tribulation, a time of great trouble and trial and sorrow. That's all going to be going on on earth, but I'm going to miss it because I know Jesus. Jesus is going to return for me and take me out of this world, and I'll go be with him while all this is going on. At the end of that period of time of judgment, which will actually turn the hearts of Israel to their Messiah, so that when Jesus returns a second time on a white horse, Revelation 19, he's called the Word of God. They're going to look on him whom they have pierced, and they're going to look with a look of faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. We return with him when he, he comes back to the earth and actually sets up a kingdom for a thousand years. Some people say it's really not a thousand years. I say, oh yeah, it's really a thousand years. They say, oh no, that's just a long time. You see, a thousand's a large number. A thousand is not a large number. A hundred million million's a large number. That's also found in the Revelation. If he wanted to use a large number, he would use a hundred million million. And really said, hey, that's, that's a large number. He says very specifically, six times he's going to set up this kingdom for 1,000 years. And that's just the introduction to paradise because when that's done, this world, this heaven and earth is dissolved. New heaven and new earth is created where we live with the Lord forever. I'm saying all of this. He says, listen, you see the grand plan that God has? And he says, be patient. Your suffering is nothing to be compared to the glory that is going to follow. Be patient when you suffer. Be patient. He says, see how the farmer, he waits for the land to yield its valuable crops? Be like the farmer. Wait patiently because the second coming is going to happen and eternity is going to make this life seem so much a tiny speck. Be patient. Be patient. Be patient. People will come along, Peter said, and they're going to say, oh, where is the coming he promised? Uh, he said, don't forget this one thing. Dear friends, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. You see, God is not, uh, he's not a creature. He's not some big guy with a long flowing beard up there and he's got a lightning bolt in his hand ready to zap you if you, you, you step out of line. That's not God, that's a characterization. God is outside of time and time is nothing to him. Before Abraham was, I am, Jesus said. He said, I, I, I exist in the past, present, and the future because I'm not bound by time. For me, a, a day... It's like a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. Now, if you take of a thousand years, it's like a day to God. Jesus has only been gone for two days. He's only been gone two days. Don't be so impatient with him. Jesus is coming back, just not on your time schedule. Jesus is coming back. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. Some understand slowness. No. 
He is patient. You know God is patient. I mean, he puts up with us, doesn't he? God is patient. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Everyone to come to repentance. He's waiting till that last person he knows is going to come to faith in Jesus Christ, and then he'll return. Repentance. It's interesting, there's, you know, the Baptist preacher and the Catholic uh, priest were, got together because uh, there was, uh, the end was near, and so they had a sign that said, repent, the end is near, and they stood on the side of the road. Cars would go by, and they'd scoff, and they'd laugh as they went on, and then you'd hear this big screeching of tires, and then big, huge crash. One after the other, and then finally the priest said to the Baptist minister, he said, you think maybe we should just put, turn around, bridges out ahead? Repent. He is patient, not wanting anyone to perish. It's our job to tell them, hey, the bridge is out ahead. Turn around, turn around, so that they can come to the same salvation we have and spend all eternity with Jesus. Be patient, be patient. Second thing he says in our passage is, when you're suffering, a true mark that you have a faith that works is that you're patient, but also that you are steadfast. To you, be patient, stand firm. Literally, it means to make your heart firm. That's the literal rendering of the text. Make your heart firm. So I got a heart here, and it's planted in the ground. It's got a good foundation. Make your heart firm. The steadfast person, like the Apostle Paul, once he came to Christ, he was steadfast. He made his heart firm. He was not wavering. He was staying with those truths. And he said that there was a crown of righteousness laid up for him. And he says, a crown of righteousness to all them that love his appearing. You see, they're holding on, standing firm, realizing Jesus is coming back for me. I'm not wavering in my faith. Jesus is coming back for me, for me. Be steadfast. The next one I like is be happy. Don't grumble. I told you a while back when I was a teenager, I had a drug experiment that went, went awry and killed my two friends, and, and I survived, and I was uh, in the hospital, and about three days later, I finally came around, and then um, uh, I had lost uh, feeling in my whole left leg, and uh, I still have problems from time to time with my left foot and my, my left leg anyway. I was going through the physical therapy where you walk through the bars, you know, trying to get, so I could walk without feeling my foot, okay? It was really kind of a weird experience. I'm really pretty good right now, okay? Cold weather really bothers me, so I, I try to keep my feet warm. But other than that, I, I was walking through, I was walking through the thing, and there was this sign on the, on the, uh, uh, on the wall there, and these, this is what it had. And I finally I said, said to the, the therapist, I said, what in the world is that? And, and the therapist said, sound it out. It's quit your belly aching. <laughs> I laughed and chuckled. And that's, that was the whole purpose. It was to make fun of me because I was complaining about what I was going through. And, oh, poor me, quit your belly aching. And it was just very humorous, and I've never forgotten that. You know, when, when we're, we're suffering, and... and and it hurts. It's painful. All that, all that kind of stuff. I just have to quit my belly aching. There's a book in the Old Testament. It's called, uh, it doesn't have this name, but it should. It should be called Grumbling or Complaining or Belly Aching. And that's the book of Numbers. Because in the wilderness, that's all the Israelites did was complain to God. There's like 14 complaints in, in the book. They're just belly achers. And God did not take to bellyaching kindly. We are to be grateful and realize that he is sovereign. You know, the Apostle Paul, every time he found himself suffering in jail, he prayed. And when he was shackled to another prisoner, he didn't say, God, get me out of these terrible circumstances. He said, hey, <laughs> this guy can't get away. I'm going to witness. I'm going to share my faith with this guy. I've got him for a whole watch. He can't escape. I'm going to tell him about Jesus. Was he bellyaching? No, he was proclaiming his faith. we got to just be happy in the station of life that God has assigned to us in his sovereign providence. He says, or you will be judged. 
He does not take kindly to belly aching because the judge is standing at the door. At any moment, he can intrude in space and time to make our situation whatever he wants to make of it because he is the sovereign Lord God of this universe. He says, be exemplary. Brothers, as an example of uh, of patience in the face of suffering. That's what he says, in the face of suffering. You've all heard this. I got these foot feet print by the sand. I, I want to read the poem. You, you've heard this poem? I just want to refresh your memory. One night I dreamed, a, uh, I dreamed a dream, and as I was walking along the beach with my Lord, across the dark sky f- flashed scenes of, from my life. For each scene I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonged to me and one to my Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. I noticed that at many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me. So I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times in my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why, when I needed you the most, you would leave me. He whispered, my precious child, I love you and will never leave you. Never, ever during your trials and testings. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Isn't that so true? We take way too much credit. That I was, you, you left me and that was all, no, God, God is carrying me. Somebody realized how we do that and they wrote a second poem. It says, one night I had a wondrous dream, one set of footprints there was seen. The footprints of my precious Lord, but mine were not along the shore. But then some stranger prints appeared, and I asked the Lord, hey, what have we here? Those prints are large and round and neat, but Lord, they're too big for feet. My child, he said in somber tones, for miles I carried you alone. I challenged you to walk in faith, but you refused and made me wait. You disobeyed, you would not grow. The walk of faith you would not know. So I got tired, I got fed up, and there I dropped you on your butt. (laughs) Because in life there comes a time when one must fight and one must climb, when one must rise and take a stand, or leave their butt prints in the sand. (laughs) God expects us to be exemplary. When I suffer, it's my opportunity to depend on the Lord all the more, and when he carries me through it, to praise his name for it so that others can see how the righteous trust God in their suffering. It's easy to be a Christian when everything's going well. The real metal of our faith is when it's not, and we still trust God, and others watch us and say, whatever they've got, I want that too. Because their God, their Lord, their Savior carries them through. That's when we're our greatest witness. That when everything's going well. The next one is be persevering. Persevering. He says, as you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. The word persevere means to remain under. You got all this pressure. This guy's got pressure. <laughs> He remains under. You know, he, 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 he's got a lot of pressure. Sometimes the suffering, the difficulties, the problems seem like they're just pushing you right into the ground and you just want to quit. You want to quit life. You want to quit everything. He says persevering means you remain under no matter how bad it gets. Notice this, the sentence is incomplete. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered You have heard of Job's perseverance. And you have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. We need to be expectant that what God did for Job, he will do for me. What God has done for others in the Bible, he will do for me. I have this expectancy. For Job, Satan went into the presence of God and said, I've been going through all the earth. And God said, hey, have you noticed my servant Job? You see, Satan didn't initially pick on Job. God said, hey, here's one of my stars. And he said, oh my, he only only follows you because you bless him. 
You know what? You take all his blessings out. And God says, okay, do anything. Don't take his life. Man, he took all of his possessions, wiped them out. Took all of his kids, wiped them out. Took all of his cattle, wiped them out. The guy had nothing. And it says, you know what Job said? The Lord gave, blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord took away, blessed be the name of the Lord. I'll tell you, that's a man of great faith. He was exemplary. He was exemplary, and he persevered. Satan goes back to God, and God said, what do you think of my servant Job? He said, skin for skin, man, I'll tell you what. You touch his, his body, God said, hey, you do anything you want to him, just don't take his life. Poor old Job, he's covered, with, he's, he's covered with boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He's in agony and pain. And, and, and his wife is, is against him. He's got three buddies that come along. You're, you know the story. His three buddies come along, and they spend three weeks, I believe it is, with him. And I haven't had any buddy, when I've been sick, come along and wait on me for three weeks. A paid nurse would do that. These are true friends. But they're basically saying, it's all your fault, Job. You just need to curse God. I mean, you, you need to curse the day you were born. You, and they're saying, hey, it's all your problem. You're, you're a mess. And they all had it wrong because Job didn't know he was a test case for God. His wife didn't know. His three friends didn't know. Even Job doesn't know. He doesn't know why this is happening. You see, there's always a grander purpose to our suffering. We don't see it. God is not just assigning suffering to us just because that's a good thing to do. There is a purpose in every bit of it. At the end, when, when he finally was over, God declares who he is. I mean, he does. And then the text says, he blessed Job with twice as much as he originally had. I don't, I don't know. Uh, you don't know why your suffering is always happening. But if I'm exemplary in my suffering, maybe I will accomplish the purpose because the purpose for Job was to say, Satan, you got it wrong. Job really loves me no matter what. I don't know what's behind the scenes spiritually, why I've suffered and went through things that I've done in my life. And some of them I failed, I'm sure, and but maybe there's one that I was successful in and it was exemplary to someone else and encouraged them to walk in their faith because they seen me. I visited on a gal that was 102 years old. She was, in, in, in a, she was recovering from a fall and she was in a home and she was in this home and uh, uh, it was uh, just for the recovery phase and, and while she was there, I went in to visit her. And while I was there visiting on this 102-year-old lady, she was just chipper and happy and she, she was telling jokes. And, I mean, she'd been through some suffering here. And another lady came in and said, listen, I'm being dismissed, but I just wanted to come in and talk to you. She interrupted my visit. And she comes in, she said, I, I just been, I'm leaving, but I want to say thanks to you. You changed my life. And she started talking about how this lady was so exemplary in handling her situation. She said, you've changed my life. You think maybe her suffering at 102 came about so she could be a witness in that home to that lady? I think so. I think so. You see, we never know the grander scheme. It says the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. The final one here, I think it's the final one, is the be honest. Be honest. Here I got honest, Abe. Boy, if our, our politicians were like, <laughs> like honest, Abe. This is almost like an age that is gone by, okay? Honest Abe. Above all, my brothers, do not swear by heaven or earth or anything else. If you've got to constantly swear, I swear on the Bible, this is the truth. I swear on the Bible, this is the truth. What are you saying? The rest of the time you're not telling the truth? Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Or you will be condemned. You'll get yourself into some real sticky areas. Just be honest. Just be transparent. Just be real. I want to wrap this all up. No one enjoys suffering. In fact, I, I can guarantee you, not one of you got up this morning, got on your knees and said, pray, God, give me some suffering today. 
come on, bring it on, I need it. You don't know. No one enjoys suffering. We don't. But the hope of Christ's return should motivate us to be patient through my suffering. Hey, God's going to get me through this. I'm one of his. He's going to help me out one of these days. He's going to deliver me from it all. To be steadfast, I'm going to be firm. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be optimistic even in the face of my grief, my sorrow, my troubles, the complexities of life, my distresses. I'm going to be exemplary. I'm going to live for Jesus so others can see how a Christian lives in these terrible circumstances so that others might be provoked to faith. I'm going to persevere. I'm going to hang in there. I'm going to remain under the pressure no matter what. I'm going to be expectant that God is going to somehow be glorified in all of this, and he will really actually even reward me for my faithfulness. And I'm going to be honest about it. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not going to embellish it. I'm not going to say less of what it is. I'm just going to say it is what it is and trust the true and living God. You see, when you're living like this, now that's evidence that you've got a faith that works because you're trusting God. It's the only way you can do these things. You're trusting God, and God is working in your life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we've gathered today to, to learn from your word for you to speak to us. And I'm sure there's someone here who's got some obstacle, some problem, some trouble, some trial, some difficulty, some suffering, some anguish, some emotional pain, some mental anguish, uh, Lord, that has them down. And I pray today that they might just say, Lord, I'm handing it over to you. I'm casting all my care upon you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to be patient for an answer. I'm not going to give any demands and a time schedule. Lord, I'm just going to wait upon you. As Isaiah said, wait upon the Lord. I'll renew my strength. I'll mount up with wings like eagles. I'll walk and not be weary. I'll run and not faint. I'm going to trust you. You will display yourself to be the God, the God of Job, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, David, Solomon, Isaiah, the God of, and Father of my Lord Jesus Christ who raised him from the dead. This God who controls all things, sovereign, providentially attending to every circumstance of life, my God will infuse in me the strength to overcome and reward me greatly for it. We look, Lord, to you in a heart of faith to say, we trust you, we love you. Strengthen our faith, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we bow our heads, maybe you're carrying a burden, and uh, this is your moment. We're going to just pray silently for a moment for you to tell the Lord your burden and uh, tell him how you're going to trust him. Let's do that for a moment before we close. Lord, you have said that uh, you don't look as man looks on the outward appearance, but you look on the heart. In another place you've said, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro through the whole earth. So Lord, as you are scanning the earth, not looking on the outside, but the inside. See the hearts of each one who's here. That that they have in their heart that is their burden. See it, O Lord. Hear their cry in their heart and answer mightily as they trust in you, the only, the true, and living God. For we ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Lord's Day.